I think it joins with the literature effectively in suggesting that exercise that is reasonably similar, exercise schemes that are really similar and reasonably hard get reasonably the same results uh, with novices. And, and for people who are looking for generalized health uh, and you know they're, they're not willing to commit to a coach or a training program or something like that, that actually has some encouraging meaning. 20 minutes or 60 minutes uh, at the end result, get out there and move. So I think there is that positive takeaway there. Okay. Is it going to change my practice? No, because my clients are looking for a you know progressive training program that's going to get them past uh, those kind of results and in a more efficient time frame. Hey, Gracefield Nation, Sully here with the Barbell Prescription. We got another research review for you with um, uh, two members of our world famous research review faculty, uh, CJ Gocher. Uh, he is a Barbell Logic online coaching coach, and he's also the director of the Barbell Logic uh, Coaching Academy. Welcome, CJ. And Hi. we're joined once again, and I should say at this point, as usual, by um, our good friend Victoria Volkov joining us from Israel. And um, we're going to hit it again. Today's paper is the dose response phenomena associated with strength training is independent of the volume of sets and repetitions per session. Um, this is by uh, Evangelista et al. And this is in the review of Brazilian sports medicine uh, from January, March, 2021. Uh, so potentially, uh, a, an important paper based on uh, what they were looking at and the assertion of their findings in the title. So they, they get my approval for the title at least. And so these guys start by saying there are few studies of the effectiveness of training mo models with high volume sets per session. Really? Is that true? There are a few studies of that. I mean, we've seen a lot of them, haven't we, uh, over the last 10 years. So these guys were interested in the effect of different set rep schemes on muscle hypertrophy and strength in untrained individuals. So they did an experiment. CJ, can you elaborate a little bit on the background and tell us about the methods that they use to approach this issue? Sure. So background wise, I looked up the lead author uh, and, and the authors involved in the study. So you said Alexandra Evangelista, uh, been publishing since 2007. And the journal itself, Revista Bercelia de Medicina do Esporte, uh, was oh. legit. So it popped none of the none of the red flags for, you know, a predatory journal or anything like that. Uh, uh, this is essentially the sports science journal is the arm of the medical establishment of the sports science community within Brazil, at least as it's advertised. Uh, and, you know, it's documented the papers within are seem legit. Now, looking at the actual methods of the study and the intent, uh, uh, Sully already listed, you know, their, their big case. And I'm just going to state from the last sentence of the introduction, the aim of the present study was to investigate the effects of different weekly sets. So the set and rep scheme performed on muscle groups and investigate their morphological function response. So he is, they are intra, intra, interjecting themselves into the big debate whether rep schemes matter. Uh, there have been a lot of big studies on this, Schoenfeld, Morton et al. There's been a lot of, you know, and this has been a big question. Does it really matter in untrained or trained trainees, whether you do three by 10 or 10 by three, whether you do sets of 25 to 35 or sets of eight to 12? So they are trying to, this is essentially an observational experiment uh, on whether or not that had uh, an impact. So how they're going to test this. They start with a sample of 66 uh, individuals. There was some lack of clarity here, which we're going to see multiple times throughout the study, uh, as to how they ended up with exactly 47. But what I think, based on uh, the written text, they started out with 66. They lost six based on exclusion criteria. So did they have diabetes mellitus? Did they have diagnosed cardiovascular disease? You know, other criteria that they list in the study, uh, which left them with 30, or sorry, with the, with 60, and then 13 dropped out over the course of the study, leaving 47. That's how I think the timing went. For um, personal reasons. 13 dropped out for personal reasons. Yeah. Whatever that you know, means. You, Whatever that means, like like personal reasons could be I don't want to do this anymore. Um, whether or not there were some based on injury or there were some uh, based on we don't know. You know, the only cause listed was personal reasons, so that's what we're left with. We end up with uh, three different groups. There's a ten sets of three group, 
a five sets of six group and a three sets of 10 group with a functionally the same amount. They, they started with the same amount, 20 in each group, and they ended up with 14, 15, and 18. So not that big a difference, although the three by 10 group is slightly more represented. The sample itself, we had 23 year old males, five foot seven inches and 72 uh, kilograms. So 158 pounds for those who don't do uh, universal math. Um, and you know that allows you to kind of picture the size of the people that we're looking at and in terms of their weightlifting experience, none of them have lifted within the last six months and none of them are considered to be experienced lifters. So the first thing that came up in the demographics of the subjects themselves uh, was their numbers on the individual lifts. So when you look at the values, we see uh, they got their individual maximum, you know, their initial maximum strength tests. On the bicep curl, about 30 kilograms using bar and plates. Uh, elbow extension, so they were using a cable push down, about 55 kilograms. And then one rep max squat, 150 kilograms for their starting one rep max, 150 to 160 kilograms. That one first really perked my ear up. Because how many 158 pound completely untrained, you know, college age males or like 23 year old males do we know have 155 kilogram back squat at the start? Put it in pounds for those who only do freedom units. <clears throat> for our freedom uniters, that's about 330 to 340 pounds. Right. So everyone pay attention here because CJ is about to make a really good point. Go ahead, CJ. So, initi so initially, I thought to myself, there had to be something like there was no there was no descriptive criteria for the squat. How did they do the squat? So my initial thought is this is you know a, a case of aerobic bros measuring you know strength training bros. So maybe they were doing them high. We were dealing with some some inefficiencies there. Vic reached out to the authors, uh, which which and got their feedback on how the exercises were done. And there was some this question came up, and he replied, "Oh, it was a leg press." And they've put in an addendum with the journal to get that corrected to say leg press. So for, for me, that's, that's an immediate clarification and a reminder to the audience that there are oftentimes like when you look at a text and something doesn't seem to make sense, it may not make sense. Like there may just be errors in typography. And this is something that comes up as well multiple times. There may be like translation issues or something like that in the, in the transcription. Can't, uh, can't be sure. So we have our audience. Okay. They're doing leg press instead of squat. Got that. Uh, and they, they're broken up into their three groups. They're going to train twice a week for eight weeks doing the bicep curl, the cable push down, and the, the leg press. <clears throat> now, the way it's going to work, they're going to do a described rep scheme uh, for max repetitions. Or sorry, let's, let's even, before we even get into that, they're going to do their prescribed rep scheme, so 10 by 3. And they're going to do it with a fixed rest scheme of 90 seconds rest. Across so, groups. Across groups, so all three groups. So, are so it doesn't rest. matter what doesn't matter what kind of sets and reps you're doing. You get a ninety second rest. Okay. Yes, and they said that the groups all had you know they kept it around twenty to sixty minutes in execution time, and this is one of those like well you you prescribed A so you got B, you know doing ninety total uh, sorry doing thirty total sets so the ten by three group doing thirty total sets with ninety seconds of rest of course it ends up being sixty minutes because you you do the it actually reminds me in CrossFit the every minute on the minute. This is essentially every two minutes on the minute because you do the set. It takes anywhere from 10 to 30 seconds to complete. And then you have 90 seconds before you do the next set. So you're spending however many sets you have to complete that time times two to get it done. Now, this is where things get, you know, kind of uh, tricky. So throughout this, throughout the, the study, they say they use maximum repetitions and that the weight was increased from session to session based on whether or not they could do one to two more reps. So RPE, they're using RPE. They, they, you know, they go for maximum reps and there are maximum, yeah, maximum reps. And then if they could have done more when they hit their prescribed limit. So if they hit 10 and it's like, coach, I could have done, you know, two okay. more, then they're going to add a two to two, a two to 10% for upper body, two to 15% for lower body. Go Hang ahead. on CJ. I have a question here. So yeah. do they say in the methods that they, that they, basically used an RPE or subjective, I could have done two more or that the, or that the subject did do two more. So what they say in the methods is where this is where it gets a little conflicted. So I'm, in the methods, I was they, confused. Do, they do say that they use RPE. Uh, in fact, I'm going to pull it here. Just there we go. If a subject was able to perform one or two more repetitions, the load was increased by two to 10% for upper body and two to 15% for lower body lifts. Right. So, I see that. And I highlighted it because I had a question about it. So, so, but did they actually, 
did they actually perform the one or two more reps? Like if you're able to do one or two more reps, they actually did one or two more reps, or did they just think they could have done one or two more reps? That's not clear to me in this manuscript. Did I miss something? To me, it's only clear because they said they kept them to the rep scheme. So if a subject was able to do more, they're, they're making them do sets of 10, sets of three, sets of six. Uh, that's, that's the prescribed volume for the day. So uh, if, for me, it seemed pretty clear that that's the, the, the lifter's assessment. I have to say that's not clear to me at all. So what, what, it, what it says to me is that somebody who was, who was doing a, a set of 10 actually did 12 and they decided to advance the, because they said, again, this is not the only place where it con conflicts. What they said was that they there's somewhere in here where they said that they did them to failure. So that's where my confusion comes in because they say they do them to failure, right? Uh, they say maximum repetitions. They say they do them to failure. Now, when Vic reached out uh, and again, asked this question, and so thank you, Vic. Uh, one of the things that they said was, and, and they do mention this in the study, is that they dynamically adjusted the load the way that they did in Schoenfeld et al. 2015. Uh, and I looked at that study, and in that study, they use 90 seconds of rest, but they dynamically adjusted the load. So the idea is these guys are working their butts off. They're working really hard. They're having to crank that load pretty far down to do max sets with 90 seconds rest. Like that's a pretty dramatic, you know, switch that they're making for the lifter. Um, the author says that they, they did the same thing. So how can you dynamically adjust the load for the lifter to so that they hit within their prescribed rep range a maximal effort and yet know their RPE? Yeah, yeah, I'm I'm confused. I, like, and I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm yeah, I'm I'm certain there is a method. Like, I, like that's one thing. I'm certain it was conducted in a particular way with the student subjects at the time. How exactly that was done is unclear based on the text and based on the reply that Vic got uh, to that question. So, and we're going to see when we get to the total load lifted. Uh, Vic will cover that. Um, that it looks to me more like they followed what they said here, which is uh, increasing the load by RPE. But then that fixes intensity, and uh, I don't want to don't want to step over on that. Right, I'm yet. sorry, I didn't mean to step on you, CJ. Go ahead. Not at all. No, it's that is the confusion. Mm -hmm. You know, for me, that's the biggest open confusion in the study. So that was the program. They did it for two uh, two times a week for eight weeks, and then at the end they assess, or before the study and after the study, they assessed maximum strength and muscle, muscle thickness. I actually thought this uh, metric was was effective. So they used uh, the standard one rep max protocol, five minute, you know, loose warm up. Then you know, how many how many warm ups are we going to do? It's standardized. So is it actually a one rep max? Almost certainly not, because anyone who's gone for a one rep max knows everyone kind of has to tweak their own way into it. But for study purposes, it's consistent and it's it was consistent across groups. It was probably okay. Yeah. And the tool that they used to assess muscle thickness was ultrasonography, uh, did some research. It was a validated instrument um, that has been compared to EXA for uh, full body fat and point by point measure. So, you know, I'm effective happy, instrument. I'm, they were I'm, hap I'm happy with ultrasound. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So, and those were the methods. Okay. So we'll have more to say about all of that later on. Vic, what did they find? Okay, so if we look at uh, table two in the study, mm -hmm. uh, it's detailing the muscle strength measures after eight weeks of uh, training. So what we can see here, and also in table three that uh, details the muscle thickness measures, is that all group got statistically significant results towards, towards stronger 1RM. They did get strong, stronger, and they did get um, more muscle thickness at all three exercises ranging from 23% to 33% for muscle strength and 10 to 15% for muscle thickness. Um, but no significant difference was found between groups. So uh, this we can see more detailed in figure two uh, that allows us to examine the results uh, graphically in more depth. So if we look at figure two, it's, it's a kind of um, um, box and whisker plot. On the left along the y-axis, we can see the total six measurements the three max strength means for each exercise and the three muscle thickness means for each of the three muscles examined. And along the, the x-axis, we can see the three comparisons, each between two intervention groups. So we can see a gray column in the middle of uh, um, any, uh, any of uh, the comparisons. And it means it's, it's a gray um, area around the mean, uh, which equals zero. So it actually highlights the small to negligible mean effect size that was found, um, 0 0.2. Uh, 
uh, to call an effect size. And each main result is presented by a black dot with a rather short whiskers at each side, one for positive or right direction and one for the negative or left direction. And each direction, whether it's right or left, represents an intervention group. So um, we can see, for example, uh, if we look at the, at the right uh, column, then we see a comparison between the uh, five sets of six reps versus the 10 sets of three reps. And uh, most results, and how, how does those, the results, how can we see them? We see the mean result uh, in the black dot, which represents the mean of this result, and the confidence interval by the uh, whiskers from the right and the left. So if we examine the results in generally, generally, we can see that most of the results, most of the mean results fell into the gray area. So actually the effect sizes were small to negligible for most results, but we can see some outlier, outliers, like the, if we look at the- Biceps. Uh, the biceps brachii um, mm -hmm. thickness measurement at the fourth uh, line along the, X, the Y axis, we can see that it's in favor of the three sets of 10 repetitions group and also for the uh, 10 sets of uh, three repetition groups. So, but, um, but uh, uh, we must uh, also acknowledge that uh, in the 10 sets of three reps group, we have a wider confidence interval. Um, uh, it's, it's wider, so it's less stable because we know that we want a narrower confidence interval in order for more precise uh, uh, estimates. And, and that also happens for the 1RM elbow extension, but in favor of the uh, five sets of six repetitions, and also the vastus lateralis muscle thickness, and also in favor of the five uh, by six. So this is um, as to the effect sizes that actually show us how, uh, how much the intervention work independent of the sample sizes. And then we can look at figure two, which we'll, we'll discuss later um, on, but we can see the weekly accumulated total load lifted, um, meaning uh, all the accumulated uh, load or tonnage that all the lifters um, performed during the eight weeks of uh, all three interventions. So it was actually equalized. How was it equalized? It was a big question for us and um, Thanks to CJ's uh, calculation, we'll talk about it later. Um, and the final uh, result that we can discuss here is pre presented in table four and figure three. So it discusses the correlation between maximum strength and muscle thickness. Um, so we can see that for generally, for uh, uh, most, for all, um, for all muscles, for the biceps, triceps, and vastus lateralis, we can find muscle, a correlation between muscle uh, thickness and muscle strength. But if we look between groups, we could find correlation between strength and thickness only between the biceps and the triceps, and the vastus lateralis only for the uh, 10 by three group. Uh, so it was also um, something that um, comes up and uh, the authors try to explain in the discussion, but it wasn't so convincing. So these are the re results. Yeah, we'll, we'll talk about that in the discussion. I, I think it's pretty yes. trivial to come up with an explanation for that. Uh, to the extent that, that you know, I mean, these, are, these look like shotgun scatter plots, which sort of makes the point for them, right? Um, so, okay. So can you sum up their findings uh, in just a few words for us, Vic? Okay, so to sum up, all groups got stronger and uh, their muscle thickness also uh, got uh, significantly stronger. I don't know if it's count, it, it counts as signif clinically significant for us, but uh, these were the results. But if we look at the difference between groups, then none of the groups got, got uh, particularly stronger or thicker uh, the than the other group. Right, so uh, and go ahead. Yeah, and also we know that uh, there was no difference uh, between total tonnage or load accumulated. Well, okay, good. Do we really know that? That's the, the question. And uh, so we can talk about that in the discussion. So guys, um, what they did was they, they, they broke these bros down into three groups, 10 by three, five by six, 
um, and three by 10. Everyone got 90 seconds of rest. They adjusted the load in some fashion so that uh, they stuck more or less to this set rep scheme, although that's not entirely clear to me that, that they absolutely stuck to the set rep scheme. Uh, and what they found was really no clinically significant difference in strength or muscles, muscle thickness. Everyone got stronger, everyone got more huge, but no particular set ret seemed, seemed to be superior to the others in this short study. Okay, so on to our discussion of this. Um, CJ, is this gonna change your practice? Hmm. Is it gonna change my practice? No. Uh, kind of when I, when I was looking for the positive takeaway, cause, the, cause there's a lot of cautionary takeaways. When I was looking for the positive takeaway, uh, we make a distinction between exercise and training, you know, oftentimes like, you know, is it, is it generalized activity for the purpose of getting, you know, generally fitter or progressing towards a specific goal using, you know, we are intentionally programming. And I think it joins with the literature effectively in suggesting that exercise that is reasonably similar Exercise schemes that are really similar and reasonably hard get reasonably the same results uh, with novices. And, and for people who are looking for generalized health uh, and you know they're, they're not willing to commit to a coach or a training program or something like that, that actually has some encouraging meaning. 20 minutes or 60 minutes uh, at the end result, get out there and move. So I think there is that positive takeaway there. Okay. Is it going to change my practice? No, because my clients are looking for a you know progressive training program that's going to get them past uh, those kind of results and in a more efficient time frame. Vic, what say you? Is it going to change your practice? Uh, no, I agree with CJ on that, and I also want to add that um, in for the positive side, they did chose three exercises that anyone can do without any instruction. So really, if you want to. Uh, get a little bit more strong, a little bit more bigger, uh, no, no matter where you start from. So you can go and do any of these programs and you'll be fine. But is it good for our purposes? I think not. Okay. Now let's get into the nubby nitty gritty and talk about some of the problems with this paper um, uh, to the extent that we can take away anything that will inform our practice with it. I think CJ we can sum up a lot of the problems with this paper. You and I were talking about this earlier this morning. Uh, and I think I said something to you like this, a good research paper should be a recipe for replication, right? I should be able to read your paper and exactly reproduce, if not your results, at least the way that you perform the study. And I'm not getting that from this paper. What do you have to say about it? So going methods, there are definitely unclear parts. And, you know, Vic reaching out to the authors really did, it clarified as much as it also confused because the authors then pointed out that they were dynamically changing the load. So mm -hmm. what was that in the text about RPE? So there were, there were again, confusion there. So I absolutely agree uh, that the clarity of the piece for replication is important, not just as, you know, not just for other researchers. Like me as a coach, if I want to test this in the lay way, you know, if I want to see if this works for my clients, if I can put clients on a three by 10 program and get good results from them, uh, which some have, you know, some novice programs out there do prescribe similar with compound bar uh, barbell lifts. I can't even look at their program and, and do that. I can't do that routine. Vic? Um, uh, so there is the part that we, the, the methodology is not uh, clear enough for us to replicate. So that's one reason not to, um, to incorporate that program, program for novices. And also it's kind of, um, how do I choose? Well, I, it's, it's probably obvious that the limiting factor here is the, the group of three sets of 10. They seem to work the hardest and get the same results as the other two groups. So why would I do that and not um, the, the other, uh, I don't know, five on six on, or uh, 10 uh, by three? Uh, and I'll do the same total amount of, of volume per session and per week and uh, no matter how it takes and I'll get the same results. One of the things that uh, bugged me a little bit was this, um, 
this bar plot in figure two, where we're looking at the weekly total accumulated load lifted. Um, they didn't have any problem showing us um, like individual results in figure three, but in figure two, they just show us these sort of, you know, big bar graphs. It would be nice to know, it would be nice to know the actual spread of a uh, total load lifted of subjects during the eight weeks and eight weeks is something else that we need to talk about guys. Um, the eight weeks lifted, it would be nice to know what was going on with the individual subjects there. Um, the other issue for me that I'm thinking about, and I shared this with you guys a little bit earlier this morning, and maybe I'm crazy thinking about it. I, it just occurred to me this morning and uh, you know, maybe I'm not thinking about it properly, but you have a 90 second rest interval. Regardless of whether you're doing three sets of 10 or 10 sets of three, you have a 90 second rest interval, right? And then you're going to do another set until you're done, right? So 90 seconds of rest at any significant loading for a, even for a, a, a really heavy set of three, it kind of doesn't make sense to me as a practicing coach. But when I'm looking at it from the perspective of a subject who's actually doing this regimen, is there... Is there really that much difference in what I'm ex experiencing subjectively if I'm just taking 90 seconds of rest? I mean, when I'm looking at this, what I'm thinking about it as a guy who's actually going to do the program, I've just got one big long set with a 90 <laughs> second huff and puff interval stuck in there somewhere. So it's really just like all of them just did the same great big honking superset or cluster set or whatever you want to call it. And the only difference is where they got to stop and huff and puff for 90 seconds before they kept going. So all three groups it, it subjectively help me out here. Cause I'm just trying to wrap my head around this. They all just did one big set and they it's where they stopped to rest in that big set. That was different. Uh, am I, am I crazy? Am I thinking about this wrong? Um, I, I I'm willing to be corrected on this. Tell me guys. 90 seconds of rest seems to be a big problem here. So I've got from, from my CrossFit background, uh, this is, this looks to me like a Metcon, you know, this is, yeah, this, exactly. is a prescribed, mm -hmm. this is a prescribed metabolic conditioning workout with an, with a fixed interval, uh, with a longer interval than for instance, a Tabata. But honestly, it looks like a CrossFit workout, especially the three by 10. What I see, um, and Vic was mentioning this, that the uh, guys who are doing three by 10, so sets of 10 had a harder time of it. Well, they're condensing the same volume into 20 minutes. So their Metcon is harder uh, mm -hmm. for, for all effective purposes, especially since they lifted the same total load, which I'm sure we'll talk about here in a minute. So their intensities were probably about the same. Like they, the, and that, that was my biggest issue with it. But so these guys are doing a set of 10. So that's going to take 30 seconds. And then they've got 90 seconds in between. It's an E2 mom every two minutes on the minute. It's a Metcon, regardless of, regardless of the intention of calling it resistance training. It's a cardio workout. Very good. So it's one, if, big set. it's one big set. That's the way I, that's when I look, I was thinking about it um, this morning, almost from the time I woke up, it's like, if they were really just doing one big set and they just stopped at different places in the set to huff and puff. And then keep going until the until the set was done. So they all did the same thing. Why should more or less? Why would we be surprised that they got the same result? The real they question actually based it on on previous uh, studies that also fixed the rest interval for ninety seconds and also um, for concentric failure and, and or uh, volitional failure. So I keep asking myself, why does the research keep asking the same questions? And also, how can you compare between study protocols when they're not the same? Schoenfeld's protocol is not like Lopez protocol, and it's not like this protocol. So how can you find a, uh, find a common ground between all of these? Yeah, the, at one point in here, they say uh, the discrepancies between um, this study, and they were referring to Fink et al., uh, discrepancies between this study and our study can be attributed to the exercise used, the training level of the volunteers, and the training protocols that were different from the ones used in the study. And I'm like, wait a minute, the training protocols either matter or they don't. Right. And their assertion here is that the training protocol doesn't matter. Right. So you then can't turn around and say, well, our results were, you know, different from theirs because they used a different training protocol. So, and then there's CJ, you mentioned that the, you know, the total load lifted and the, the relative intensities. And you did in preparation for this a very, very nice sort of breakdown of what was actually probably must have been going on down in the ground. So we're going to, take a, a little break because you've already recorded the audio and the video for this. And we're going to go ahead and 
take a look at that real quick. Everybody take, take, take a look at this. If you've got two seconds, I would appreciate you checking my math while I try to figure out what their actual working sets were on average over the course of their training sessions. So for all across all three groups, they mentioned that there's 85,000 kilograms uh, total load lifted thereabouts. So if I break that down per session, so two sessions a week for eight weeks, that's 16. So each session, all three lifts combined were about 5,300 kilograms average per session. I took the maxes from each of the lift uh, given at the end of their training, so 205, 40, 70, and found the percentage that that made of their total maximal strength. So when I combined them all, 315, the leg press made up 65% of that, curl 13%, tricep extension 22% of that. If I apply that percentage to their daily average, then I get that their uh, leg press was at about 3453, 690, and 1168. And since they did 30 reps of each, I get working weights of 115, 23 kilograms, and 39 kilograms for each of these different lifts for the leg press, for the uh, bicep curl, and then for the tricep extension. Now, what I'm trying to understand are is that this this would essentially have to be applied to all three groups because there's no change in the rep scheme involved, uh, and there's no change in the uh, at least listed in the study in the percentage of increase based on RPE. So for them to have the same total load lifted across groups, and correct me if I'm wrong here, that's why I'm asking for the check, then whether you were doing three reps or 10 reps per set, you were lifting this average. So this probably started somewhere closer to 100. I could do the math assuming that they progressed every week, but this probably started somewhere closer to 100, probably ended somewhere closer to like 125, 130, something like that. And yet when they started with a one rep max leg press of 156, so that's telling me that the group doing sets of 10 was doing 80% sets of 10 at 80% of their one rep max with 90 seconds of rest. And then the groups doing sets of three was doing the same thing. So either they essentially based the weight prescribed to all the groups by the limiting factor, which is the 10 group, and then the 10 group just suffered and everyone else kind of had easy sessions. Uh, and that weight was limited by a 90 second rest. Shit, I don't even know how they would do that. Yeah, I would just, uh, if you could check my math on that one and mentally, I'm just trying to think how could they even, you know, assess like how could they how could they come to this kind of total weight lifted with the the program as described okay cj if i if i could this this is the real problem you know this is the real problem for me in the first vic i love you pointed to that i think of it it's like it's like jigsaw science or jigsaw puzzle science i'm going to look for a gap and some of those gaps are arbitrary but if i can plug that gap then any differences between other studies and mine i can justify because my study was different and if i get unique and you know interesting results for any reason then i get to claim unique and interesting results uh mm -hmm. the for me the big the big problem here actually came from reading schoenfeld's studies that they link to as like other sources so schoenfeld and ratamase's 2014 they dynamically adjusted the load the volumes were vastly different they were doing a high load and a low load group. So the volumes were different. Had to be, uh, in, right. They ha yeah, they had to be. Mm -hmm. In another one uh, in 2015, it was uh, uh, that Schoenfeld did that they were using again where they fixed, the, they fixed the speed. The tonnage was different. So this study, they were not initially, in their introduction, they never mentioned equating total load. In the discussion, it feels like it, like it was an observed finding. They mentioned, they use the word, we observed equal total load between them. And then in the discussion, it creeps in as a, as a, uh, a novel finding that when tonnage is equated between the different groups, uh, but when it, they're all, they're all equated. So if you're in the tonnage is a factor of intensity times volume, the load you're lifting times these sets and reps you're doing, there may be some factors with rest. So if I give a longer rest, maybe I could have higher intensity, you know, at the same volume, whatever. But if every other piece of that equation is the same, tonnage has to be the same. And so for me, it's like, wait a minute, if they equated volume, 30 reps in each of these exercises, right? They had to be, that was, that was part of the prescription. They <laughs> discovered that tonnage was the same. Then although I don't know what weights they prescribed for the people on the ground, average intensity had to be the same. 
So all of a sudden, the guys doing sets of I, like it, it becomes apparent. The guys doing sets of three are lifting the same weight on average from set to set as the guys doing sets of six as the guys doing sets of 10. So when Vic says the guys doing sets of 10 are working harder, yeah, they are. Like by definition, if they're lifting the same load in a vast shorter time frame. So, and now, yeah, there's that, there's that trade off. What kind of weights are we actually looking at in the workout? And then it becomes a trade off for my exerciser. Well, you know, am I going to work them hard for 20 minutes or moderate, easy for 60 minutes? It, it, it becomes very difficult to, to equate the value of this in context of all the other pieces. You guys have done like all I had to do is like stand here and ask questions. I didn't have to do anything. You guys made it easy for me. But what this boils down to for me is the real underlying problem is that there seems to be this idea in the literature that we're going to find some, some magic philosopher's stone, some magic formula that's going to work better for all comers, particularly novices, because that's where most of this is coming from. That's what most of this literature focuses on, um, that there's going to be some magic set rep schema set rep loading schema that's just going to work for everybody and it's going to make everything perfect forever and that just seems to be a really screwed up working assumption we're all coaches and we all know that the longer you have somebody training the more individualized the program has to become over time right because there's just too many other factors involved besides the external factor of like a set rep loading scheme am i making sense I think that I think that all of this literature is like it's like all of these guys are looking for Atlantis, right? They're all looking for El Dorado, right? They're trying to find some magic set rep scheme that's just going to be vastly superior to any other set rep scheme if we can just discover what it is. And during a very short intervention intervention period. During a yeah, right. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, eight weeks. We hardly talked about that. The whole the thing that it's like eight weeks. Like you can do anybody anything to anybody for eight weeks, and you, you know they're, they're going to get stronger across the board. So I almost take it the opposite direction, Sully. So like for for me, like I definitely see that a lot in the literature when they start investigating this question. Nowadays, it seems like the pendulum has swung to the opposite conclusion. We keep testing this to validate that none of it matters. We keep testing to validate that, in fact, just get out there and train and you're going to get the same results, even with trained lifters. And we experienced this with Morton et al. As a well-conducted study, they weren't trained lifters. They were actually inexperienced lifters. But that literature, I've seen research reviews from esteemed you know, publications and groups saying, oh, yeah, this study found that even experienced athletes, you know, it doesn't really matter what training you put them through. Ugh, that's exactly what we were trying not to find. Uh, for me, then... In swinging that other way, we're ignoring the realities of the differences between training 25 to 35 reps and 8 to 12. Even right. I was, gonna, like, I was going to say th this idea that it doesn't matter. E maybe it doesn't matter that much in novices. I mean, we all have our approach to novices and you can put a novice on a cookie cutter formula. And I don't care if it's three sets of five or five sets of three, you know, you're going to make them stronger just from the novice effect and from a linear progression. But in But this idea that in an advanced lifter, it kind of doesn't matter. Do you really believe that? CJ, do you really believe that? That it doesn't matter what kind of sets and reps and programming that you do in an advanced lifter? Do you really believe that? That it doesn't matter? Not only do I not believe it, and I, I love to hear Vic's take on this too. I don't think it concurs with the literature. We see, we see endurance athletes, you know, and their one RM to rep performance remains the same up to about eight reps. And then your endurance athletes have far better performance, you know, at the you know, 12 reps and 20 reps and 25 reps compared to maximally strength trained athletes because the adaptation changes. Like the structure has changed as a result of the training that they've done. So to, to suggest then that experienced or advanced athletes, it doesn't matter, goes not only against the practice, but the standing literature. It would be such, an, such a, a shocker that it would need overwhelming evidence in support of that. And honestly, I don't think most of the researchers are trying to prove that, but I think it's a lot of the readers kind of reading into the text what they want to hear. Right. So uh, when we did our very, very last SSCA conference, when we were talking about, what were we talking about? We were talking about- That was periodization. Uh, uh, yeah, we, oh, we were, no, we were talking about models of strength training, like, like, yes. like fit fat versus strength recovery adaptation. And one of the things I said was, is that um, 
instead of like getting a bunch of bros, uh, relatively untrained bros or bros on layoffs and like doing eight weeks of this and, 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 and trying to figure out what supports a particular model or not, you know, go out and look at like athletes, look at what actual strength athletes are doing. And I think, I think that if you did that, you would find that uh, the programs are so individual. And again, you could make the, you could make the conclusion, well, it doesn't matter. These like, like, you know, Polkov does heavy triples and, you know, uh, this other guy does that. And, you know, Tatiana does singles and like, no, that's not the conclusion that you reach. The conclusion that you reach is that at the beginning, anything works. And that as the lifter becomes more and more advanced, their program has to become more and more individualized to accommodate the myriad manifold biological factors that impact that individual athlete and their performance and their ability to progress. Um, uh, so, you know, again, I think, I think we're kind of looking for El Dorado here. Vic, what, what did you want to say? In addition to what you said and, and what CJ said, I think the problem lies in the definition of what is an experienced athlete. Yeah, yeah, we see that throughout the literature, don't we? Uh, we saw that with Morton, didn't we, CJ, when we looked at the, at the Morton paper, right? Self-assessed, were... been training for X number of years when they don't have a one rep max bench of their own body weight. Are we done? Did you, did, have, we, have we finished picking this apart? Um, Vic, any final words on this study? What, what, are, you, what are you taking away from it? Uh, I think this is a good example uh, to teach us to really read the, the, liter the literature carefully because things are not what they seem in the abstract or even the title. And there are so many things that can be confusing and uh, not so clear. If you really dive into the text, then you raise the important questions and then you can see sorts of discrepancies. I was really shocked by this, the, the amount of these uh, gaps in the study. So, yeah. CJ, what's your final takeaway for our viewers? Bes like, cool. Besides that, I, Vic's, Vic hit it right in the head. The only thing I'd add is when you at first suggested that maybe we do this one, uh, my initial thought was, ah, it's, you know, it's an, it's an ir irrelevant study. Uh, it's, it's from a, you know, a, a, it has zero citations yet. It was just released this year, you know, and there's, there's such a pile of literature on already. And I realized, Hey, there's a lot of lessons to pull, just like Vic said, but B, if, if you conduct a systematic review or a meta-analysis, there's not really any reason not to include this data. You know, and so if I'm trying to, I mean, maybe I could use, you know, uh, one of the, the metrics of study quality and decide that it doesn't meet my criteria, but you have to like work at it. So if somebody just goes through and does a meta analysis, this will get folded in the pile along with all the others and flatten out differences between rep schemes that are important for your post novice athlete for a lot of the lifters that we work with. Because once we work with them for six months, they're not novices anymore and they don't respond like novices. So especially older lifters, for instance, with the high intervariability of their, their response to stimulus. Uh, I do feel like it, it's worth looking at the methods and, and uh, like tacking on before it gets folded into the data. So we, we can point to it later and go, yeah, that's what that said, but consider what's in that sausage. Uh, I agree. I think uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's a good paper to look at uh, to see the kind of problems that we encounter all the time in the methodology. Uh, for me, I think it underscores the point that if you read a research paper, you should be able, at least in principle, to say to yourself, yeah, I, I can replicate the study. I know exactly what happened in the lab. And if you read a paper and you say to yourself, I'm not sure what was going on in the lab, then you really need to regard the results with caution. And then finally, at the end of the day, when I look at a paper like this, I always ask myself, what is the impact on my practice going to be of this paper? And I'm sad to say that, A, most of the time, I don't see a potential impact on my practice. And B, in this case, I don't see a potential impact on my practice. But as you point out, and I think that's excellent, CJ, this, will, this is the kind of thing that will get folded in to a meta-analysis and have an impact on, on the outcomes and the conclusions of a meta-analysis. And people these days tend to regard meta-analysis sort of the gold standard. I actually don't think it is, but we can go into that uh, uh, another time. Uh, people see a meta-analysis as the top of the, uh, top of the evidence pyramid, and I don't really think it is. 
but a study like this will get folded into a meta-analysis and have an impact uh, on a much larger study that incorporates these subjects. And so, you know, I think that uh, I think that we have to be cautious with that level of evidence. The study but, did get uh, the higher uh, level of evidence because it's in RCT. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Such as it is. All right, guys. Um, CJ, I want to thank you for the um, for the extra work that you did on that presentation with the numbers and Vic. Great job reaching reaching out to the authors and getting some clarification on this uh, for us. It was kind of them to share that with you and respond to you. Um, I'm sorry we couldn't be more generally positive about the study, um, but you know, hopefully they'll they'll keep working and uh, and. Maybe, who knows, maybe they'll incorporate our critique into their next study design. We'll see. Guys, uh, Vic, be safe out there. And um, CJ, be well. Thank you guys for your hard work on this. And uh, we'll see you next time. See you. Thank thanks, you. For thanks for watching, everybody.